an Audrey Battalion at War, the story of the 2nd Battalion, the Essex Regiment in the Great War, Episode 10, Saving the Line. We'd left the 2nd Battalion, the Essex Regiment, as part of the 12th Infantry Brigade of the British Army, fighting to the north northeast of the city of Belgium, city of Ypres. And this is part of the Second Battle of Ypres, which is ultimately a, a German attack, including the use of gas, which we covered in Episode 9. The battalion had been holding the line, say, to the north northeast, in the area of Kitchener's Wood, Widget, and a farm that was called Mousetrap Farm. And one of the people that we have encountered quite a few times in our episodes, Lieutenant Moneypenny, has left quite a good story. Again, we've looked at this covered in Karen Farrington's book of his letters and diaries, and it gives a good impression of what it was like to be held in the line there. The battalion had held the line after a gas attack, counter-attacked, regained trenches. This is all in episode 9. And whilst they're still in the line, they find themselves under repeated attacks by both artillery and infantry. So here we go to Money Penny. This ceaseless shelling began to tell badly on us all, and we had to grind our teeth to try and bear it. Our nerves were strung to an excess, excess pitch. Quite a number of men went mad. On my own platoon, there was a man I'd been watching. He had a peculiarly wild look in his eyes, and his teeth were chattering. Suddenly, he pulled the bayonet off his rifle and came at me, brandishing it like a dagger. I managed to seize his wrist, but he had the strength that madness gives. My sergeant tackled him from behind, and we pinned him to the ground, then tied his arms and legs with his putties. He was stark, raving mad. His brain had snapped. A shell landed on him later, and his worries were over. And the British Army was basically finding itself under repeated attacks, pressure from the Germans, here in green on this map from the official histories. And the British front line, supported by the French in blue here, um, is falling back towards this town of Ypres under pressure. We return to Moneypenny again. He gives us another example of what was going on. The next day came three more assaults, all in a hail of shells and for the first time my revolver came into use. In the last assault, some of the Germans got right into our position, and there was a few minutes of violent struggle. Two had gone down before my revolver, when as a bayonet came at me, I realised I had an empty gun in my hand. I hurled it at my assailant's face. This made him shift his arm up to shield his face, and I grabbed his rifle with all my might just below the muzzle. Just then, a wild, cursing apparition with a British, British uniform and a bayonet dripping with hot red blood plunged it into my adversary's stomach. We seemed to have gained an ascendancy, and some of my men were hurling bombs as fast as they could at others of the enemy still approaching the position. I don't quite know how, but this affair eventually simmered down, and we still held the position, though the shell fire continued with renewed vigour. And after defending this position for some time, the battalion is pulled out of the line for a short period of rest. However, this rest isn't to last very long because uh, the attacks are continuing and the British Army is running out of men. And the main part of our story is going to involve this place, um, originally called Shell Trap Farm, and uh, later the name was changed to Mouse Trap Farm because that was deemed to be sort of better for morale. And um, the second Essex have been brought out the line after quite a hammering and we're going to go back for a period of rest and refit. But the pressure of the German attacks meant that a number of units started to give way. And we returned to the idea of putting up the line, just pushing any troops in to, to fill the, the frontage that has to be covered. And some of the troops that were put into this area, um, to the sort of south of where the 2nd Essex had been, were dismounted cavalry. And dismounted cavalry were typically smaller units, but they're still trained in infantry skills. They're not kind of cavalry as we see them with the old uh, lances and stuff in, in Wall Wall uh, Wellington's time. But it's always a story of the units on the, on the flanks that start to give way. And looking at the regimental history uh, by Burroughs written after the war, we pick up some of the information um, from there. And this is talking about the 13th of May, 1915. At 4am on a day of cold north winds and dismal rain, the Germans started battering the front line from Shelltrap Farm southwards. And at 5.30, dismounted cavalry were noticed retiring on the right, where the 1st and 2nd Cavalry Divisions had suffered terribly. There was a lull in the bombardment for a quarter of an hour, and then it commenced again. Shelltrap, 
or mousetrap farm was held by an infantry company and situated upon a slight elevation was easily visible from Widget. It was a substantial structure surrounded by a moat and its retention was important because it afforded excellent observation to the north. The green fields far into the distance being dotted with the red roof of farmhouses. Just before 7am, a body of men was seen retiring from the ridge about 100 yards south, evidence that the farm itself had probably fallen to the enemy. Lieutenant Colonel L. O. W. Jones, observing this, on his own initiative ordered Lieutenant J. V. Atkinson, commanding C Company, to put onto the farm and reinforce it, or, if it were in German hands, to retake it. And I should mention at this point that the 2nd Essex have kind of been brought forward into some support trenches just behind the front line. And so, having expected to have a period of rest, they'd been turned around, dumped their packs kind of to lighten their load and to allow them to be more mobile, and moved into support trenches. And now, C Company are going to push over this ground that we see illustrated in this drawing to attack the farm. Five minutes, this is returned to the regimental history. Five minutes later, 7.05 a.m., the latter company moved off. But when the leading sections reached the farm, the farm was found to be held by the Germans. The company attacked in good order under heavy artillery and rifle fire and were held up for a short time by a motor around the farm buildings into which several men fell. A machine gun was ably handled by Sergeant Cousins and aided by it fire, the company drove the enemy out. Lieutenant Atkinson was wounded, thus Shelter Farm was regained. So if we think of that, there's kind of within a few minutes of being told you've got to attack, the company has gone into the attack. So there wouldn't have been much chance for much coordination or, or issuing of orders. So it was probably quite a basic plan of attack. Now, having actually attacked the farm at just after 7 a.m. in the morning under their own um, kind of decision making from the battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Jones, at 8.20 a.m., the general officer commanding of the 11th Brigade, and the Essex had been attached to them, issued the following order to the Essex Regiment. Retake at once front line from Shell Trap Farm to Fortran Wichent Road, a frontage of 1,000 yards. And this is because those cavalry units that we discussed had been kind of pushed backwards. Now, the house, the farmhouse, Shell Trap Farm, was already being held by C Company under the, left -hand, the wounded Lieutenant Atkinson. So the three remaining companies were part, going to take part in the counter-attack. A Company, which was commanded by our friend Lieutenant Noel Irwin, were to retake trenches between Fortune Wichon and St Julian Wichon Roads, with its left on the junction. So this is a trench map from the time, uh, just a bit after the time of this battle. I'm afraid I couldn't find one in time for the actual date of 13th of May 1915. The German trenches are marked in red, the British trenches are marked in blue, and we can see down at the very sort of bottom edge of this map, about just over halfway from left to right, the widget, which I'm probably mispronouncing very badly, so apologies for anyone that's causing pain to. We can see a fork in the road, and that's the two roads that were mentioned there. So Irwin's company has got to take up a position between these two roads. And in his own account, Noel Irwin, remember Infantry Officer, the, the, the book that we've referred to before, um, Irwin describes it slightly differently. He said that he was leading the left front company or left forward company, whereas actually he's the right company of the, the battalion according to the regimental history in the war diary. It was no fun, and so this is Irwin writing after the event, it was no fun advancing into and through that murderous bombardment. Nevertheless, we reached the cavalry trenches and reinforced them. Not a moment too soon, because the cavalrymen were utterly done in and would have been incapable of seriously resisting an assault had one been launched. Why it was not launched was a mystery. Now, Irwin's account is kind of written in the, the third person, uh, or sort of written as if it's by somebody else, so it continues. When Irwin reached the front line, only he and three men were left. They ran from one part of the trench to another, maintaining a rapid fire all the time, so keeping 200 of the enemy at bay. He describes what happened. When we reached the front line, we could see the Germans in their trenches standing head and shoulders, o shoulders over their parapets, watching the British trenches being pulverised beyond possibility of resistance. With our rifles and an abandoned cavalry machine gun, which a couple of my men got into action, we drove the grinning and gloating Germans underground. Their moment to attack had passed. 
Had one bit then been attempted, it would have been greeted by a resolute defence. So that's Irwin holding the gap between the two roads. The other companies that come up are B Company under Captain Pichel, which remember is our Baron of Pagelsham, and he was going to go to the left of Irwin's company, joining up between the roads and heading towards the farms. And then D, A, D Company would then follow them up, uh, come behind them as a reserve, but then once they're in the front line, because so many men were needed to man the front line, they would then turn left, come along behind the Essex Regiment, and then fill in the gap between Pachelle's B Company and the guys over at Shell Trap Farm A Company that are holding, oh sorry, C Company that are holding it. So from right to left, it would be A Company between the two roads, B Company from the road to short of Shell Trap Farm, B Company between the end of that company and the farm, and C Company holding the farm, which ultimately means there's no reserve. So let's return to Moneypenny, who um, gives us more information on this attack. While in reserve this time, we received a few more reinforcements in the form of drafts. My company, in which I'd been the sole officer to come back, had dwindled to about 30 men. These drafts brought it up again to about 100 or half strength. An officer who had been wounded previously and returned took charge over my head, so this is Lieutenant Smith Masters, as he was senior to me. There were in the draft some men returned from hospital and a few new lads, quite youngsters. I was sorry for them as their baptism of fire was not gentle. Once again, we had scarcely, scarcely rested when we were required in action again. I remember just having had a wash and a shave, the rain had supplied the water, and a bit of a meal when the stand-to-arms order came. The cavalry, who had previously mentioned being put in line to do infantry work, were being overwhelmed by a fresh assault. We were called to rescue their left flank. So over the top we went in broad daylight, up a long slope for 200 yard, or 2,000 yards. I'd missed an inferno of shells, the screeching of bullets and a downpour of rain. We moved up in extended order, keeping a beautiful line as if on parade. When within 500 yards of the enemy, occupying the cavalry's left position, we were halted and laid down. This was either to give us a breather and collect more control of the men, or perhaps some hitch had occurred elsewhere. I don't know which. Anyway, I remember laying there with two new youths, one on each side of me at a few paces interval. Great shells were falling all around and machine gun bullets splattered mud over us at other intervals. One of those boys who could not be more than 20 was sobbing helplessly. Now remember, Irving's not much older himself. I tried to, oh sorry, Moneypenny, he's not much older himself. I tried to cheer him up with a few words. The next instant there was a rush of air and sound and an 8-inch howitzer shell landed right on top of him. His worries were over. The blast of the shell displacing the air at my low level rolled me over several times, but I was none the worse by a shaking. The poor chap had completely disappeared. Where he had lain was nothing but a reeking hole. The boy on the other side had fainted. Presently we moved on, and just before the final rush into the enemy in our front uh, into the enemy in our front line trench, I grabbed a dead man's rifle and bayonet, having had a sudden feeling that a revolver might be inadequate. I do not know how much steel was crossed, but as I moved up, I was busy emptying the magazine of the rifle into our opponents, and by the time I had reached bayonet distance, there did not seem to be many of them there, and those were holding up their hands in surrender. There must have been more terrified than us at the prospect of cold steel, so we collected the first batch of prisoners that I had handled, and at the first opportunity sent them back under a guard. Quite a number of them, however, didn't get very far as they were killed by their own shell fire. I was looking around for the other youth who had been lying near me on the advance up the slope and who had fainted. I found him dead with a bullet through the chest, lying some twenty yards behind the trench. He never reached the chance of crossing bandits with the enemy. When was my turn coming? And the battalion is successful in its attack. It is recaptured Shell Trap Farm. It's cleared the trenches between Shell Trap Farm and to the south, taken them back down to the roads and has fulfilled the objective of the attack order that had been given earlier that morning by the, the officer in charge of the 11th Infantry Brigade. And they're going to end up staying in and around this area for a bit longer into the, the Battle of Second Epe as it continues. But for the battalion, the 13th of May 1915 was a very significant day in taking part in this attack and, and potentially saving the line. And 
both the War Diary and the Regimental History um, have information where their divisional commander, the brigade commander, have sent through congratulatory notices to the battalion after the attack because of their, their efforts. And the Regimental History talks about soldiers from a nearby battalion, the London Rifle Brigade, standing up and cheering the Second Essex as they advance into their attack against Shell Trap Farm. So whilst they were successful in their mission and received plaudits from the command structure, it did come at a cost. And the regimental history and the war diary talk about 37 killed, uh, this is from the regimental history, 94 wounded and 49 missing. But my own research finds the numbers to be slightly different. And we can see from the Commonwealth War Graves Commission uh, database here, there's actually 54 men killed on this day. Now of this 54, uh, 15 of them are what I class as originals. They were with the battalion on the 22nd of August 1914 when it hit, hit France as it shipped out. And approximately 40% of them actually have firm Essex connections. And many of them are have been denied the, the right of a, a known burial and are commemorated on the uh, Menin Gate, on the uh, the panels there to show that everybody has got a, a place where their name is being recorded and there's a couple of people that we can perhaps pick out so one is Sergeant um, Cousins now Sergeant Cousins was one of two brothers and this is the Sergeant Cousins that was uh, noted in the regimental history as using the machine gun that helped get past the problem of the moat and he was part of the machine gun section so that makes sense and the other picture that we have here is Corporal Jennings, Lance Corporal Jennings. Now, this is John Jennings, and he was also one of the original serving at the outbreak of the war. And the reason that I've picked these two out, and obviously there's 54 other or 52 others that we could name and consider, is that they both come from the small town of Rayleigh in Essex, um, and this is their names on the local war memorial. Going back to the men in Gate, there was many other men. There's a Sergeant Stephen Van who was from Rayleigh, which is not that far from uh, from Romwell, sorry, it's not that far from Rayleigh. He had previously served 12 years with the battalion and was recalled at outbreak as a reservist. His brother was also recalled, but his brother died of gastritis before deployment. And so we every every name has a story, and I don't want this our episode, our story is just to reflect upon the fighting and kind of as if that's a glorious thing we should not forget the cost of it and the men served in many different ways and one of the the, the members of the battalion was serving as a stretch bearer or many of them would have been but this one singled out private east staff for conspicuous gallantry and great devotion to duty on the 13th of may 1915 east of Ypres. As one of the stretcher bearers, he moved about the whole afternoon under a heavy fire picking up the wounded who he carried in on his back. After the battalion was drawn in the evening, private staff remained behind until about 1am, at which time he succeeded in getting all the wounded in. He showed an absolute disregard for his own safety. Now mentions there about uh, the battalion being withdrawn, well it was pretty much a spent item by then and was pulled back into reserve as a kind of final blow to the battalion as they came back, to, when they got back to their packs, their, their rucksacks, whatever you want to call them, they found that they'd all been ransacked and items had been stolen from them, clearly probably from by other soldiers. So the 13th of May 1915 has seen the 2nd Battalion Essex Regiment potentially saving the line, saving the Empire, by getting in and holding the line when other troops were starting to give way. Hopefully this episode has given you some idea of what went on there. And just in case you were travelling by the area, you can see where we've superimposed this map over um, the modern map is that the shell trap farm, mouse trap farm, whatever you want to call it, is right by the, the end of this kind of junction of the motorway where the motorway should have continued onwards but was stopped and gives us this kind of weird T-shape. So that was episode 10 of an Audrey Battalion at War in which the 2nd Battalion Estrella Jones saved the line on the 13th of May 1915. Uh, I look forward to catch you in the next episode when we follow the battalion's adventures through 1915.